Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Russell Blackford. He is a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, a laureate of the International Academy of Humanism, and he also holds an honorary appointment as conjoint senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Newcastle in Australia. He is the author of several books, including Freedom of Religion and the Secular State, 50 Great Myths About Atheism, The Mystery of Moral Authority, and The Theory, th th Tyranny of Opinion. So, Dr. Blackford, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, pleasure to be here with you. Great. So, I would like to ask you first, as an atheist, how do you understand religious freedom? Religious freedom, well, basically I understand it quite simply just as freedom from being persecuted on religious grounds or anti-religious grounds, if it comes to that, by the state. Right? It's a freedom from religious persecution. Now that concept can get much more difficult, but, but that's my basic understanding. Uh, I mean, we go into how much that then becomes a positive right to be able to you know, act on your religious beliefs you know, without... Um, having secular laws cut across what you're doing, all sorts of issues arise. It becomes a complex issue. But fundamentally, the, the issue is freedom from being persecuted either for not following the state's approved religion or, or being persecuted for following a religion that the state disapproves of. Mm -hmm. Historically, when did these types of debates surrounding freedom, freedom of religion start? Look, they become very important in the early part of the 16th century. Hmm. Now, we'll find precursors back in you know, classical antiquity, we'll find precursors in, you know, in medieval times, but they really become important you know, after 1517 when you know, the Reformation, as we now think of it, you know, began with uh, Martin Luther, you know, the famous 95 Theses, and it, it went on from there. The 16th and 17th centuries you know, notoriously were a time of you know, religious warfare, the great wars of religion in France, you know, the Thirty Years' War in the following century, that's the 17th century, and you know, numerous other stories of persecution and warfare over religion at that time. So that's when it becomes really important from our modern point of view. You can trace it back to the early 16th century. Mm -hmm. Do these deba debates involve thinking about the relationship between the state and the church? Well, they're very much about the relationship between the state and the church. I mean, the state in those days was very different from the state as we know it now, but nonetheless, there, there were kings, you know, there were the bureaucracies that those kings had serving them, you know, there were, there were armies, you know, there were people equipped with fire and sword. And at that time, you know, the church was able to exert its influence to you know, use state power, to burn people at the stake, imprison people, you know, drown Anabaptists as notoriously happened you know, in, in Europe. You know, re religion in the form initially of the Roman Catholic Church, if we're talking about Europe, and then the Protestant churches that arose in the 16th century, you know, was able to access you know, the secular arm, as they say, the, the, the power of the king of the you know, the government, the secular government of the state, you know, you know, to carry out these actions. You know, secular here, by the way, just means something like of this world, right, or of time rather than of eternity. So people often talk about, you know, the spiritual and the secular or the temporal and the spiritual, that, those kind of concepts. You know, while a religion that felt very strongly that it had to be followed for purposes such as spiritual salvation, uh, when it had access to the power of the state, you know, it could use that power in very, you know, very forceful ways. So how would you define a modern secular state? Well, when I talk about a secular state, all I really mean is a state which is not making its decisions on the basis of religious considerations. Mm. And for these purposes, I'm thinking of religious considerations as considerations about um, 
a transcendent reality, you know, a supernatural reality, or even the absence of a supernatural reality. I mean, I, I, there's a sense in which the USSR, for example, was a secular state, right? Because it was an atheist state. It was not making its decisions on the basis of religious concerns. It was actually anti-religious. And in its early decades, you know, things changed a little bit around World War II for reasons that we possibly don't need to detain us. But in its early days, it's persecuting religion because it thinks of religion as you know, something that's an impediment to communist progress. Now, you can say, well, that's secular in a sense because the USSR there is acting on the basis of what is, in a sense, a secular theory of Marxism as interpreted by Lenin and you know, other leading uh, Marxist figures in Russia. But, but for me, that is not how a secular state should be acting. It's not what I think of as the, you know, the paradigm of how a secular state acts. A secular state is a state that should be divorcing itself from religion, you know, both ways. It should not be persecuting religion, you know, a disfavoured religion or religion generally, but it also should not be acting on a religious basis. It should not be forming public policy on such basis as, you know, if we adopt this law or we adopt this policy or we set up this institution, it might, for example, help people be, you know, saved in a spiritual sense so that they have a yeah, a good time in the afterlife. You know, the state should not be acting on that basis. So that's my conception, really, of a secular state. You know, in my book, Freedom of Religion and the Secular State, that's the kind of modern non-religious state that I'm talking about, a government that's got religion out of its consideration. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the kinds of situations where the state should interfere with religious practices? Well, I'd be pretty reluctant to interfere with religious practices. But that said, if the state passes a neutral law that applies to everybody, it's not passed a law for some contrived purpose to get at a religion, but because it doesn't want anybody, say, murdering people, you know, sacrificing people, whatever it might be, well, that's a law that can quite properly cut across religious practice, right? So if we had, if we had an Aztec religion still around, and the adherents of that religion were going around, you know, capturing people in their, their wars, you know, their local little wars inside our, our society, and they're sacrificing those people. That might have a religious motive behind it, but it's clearly something we can't put up with. You know, it, 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 it's harmful in an obvious way. So in that sort of context, you've got a neutral law. It's not aimed in a contrived way at hitting a religion. We don't want anyone to murder people. And it's a general application. It applies to everyone, not just to the religious. Uh, I, I think it's fine. You know, this is a controversial view, actually, very controversial in American uh, you know, law or the First Amendment. But my view, uh, not that popular in the US, is that neutral laws of general applicability in that sense uh, yeah, can apply to anyone if they hinder the religious. Well, generally speaking, I think the religious have to put up with it. You, 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 at least that's the starting point. There might be some cases where you say can, we can make exceptions, but you know, I, I think those exceptions are kind of accommodation that should be thought through carefully. The, the other side of it, though, before we move on, I should just say, though, that the other side of this is we should not be making laws for purposes that do not relate to ordinary human welfare in this world. You know, there can be all sorts of reasons for making laws. And you know, if you start making laws on a whole range of, as it go beyond that, you know, intuitive ideas about traditional morality or just tradition, or just traditional ideas about morality or paternalism, you know, a whole range of reasons for making laws can lead you to be making more laws than I would say are strictly necessary. And the more you do that, this is the little libertarian streak in me here, the more you do that, the more you risk cutting across not just the way the religious want to live, but you know, maybe the way other people want to live. So I, I do just have that worry that 
if we just say that any religiously neutral law, any law that's applicable to anybody is open slather, yet that may lead us into making laws that I would not accept. But I'm, but I'm reluctant to be handing out privileges just to the religious. You know, that, that's, so that's the two sides of the way I see these issues about lawmaking. Mm -hmm. Very well. So uh, how would you define atheism? I mean, what characterizes atheism? Is it simply the lack of religious belief or something more? It's a surprisingly hard question <laughs> because... <laughs> Yeah, because, I know that's yes, one of the reasons why I asked it. <laughs> yeah, because historically all sorts of people were yes, stigmatized as atheists. They might have actually believed in God, but they didn't believe in a God who is providential, yeah, who interferes in the way history unfolds. Or yeah, they they don't believe in I know divine revelation. They may only believe in a God who's knowable through rational thought or something. Or, or you know, we call some of these people um, yeah, deists or deists these days, mm -hmm. but that they might well have been accused of being atheists. But for me, it really just means you don't have a belief in God or in any gods, right? Atheos, that, you know, just a negation of you know, the idea of God. But some people will insist that you have to positively um, disbelieve in any gods and deny that they exist. This is where it gets controversial. And I don't like getting bogged down in arguments about semantics. For, from my point of view, it's a person who doesn't have a God belief, but I don't want to be kind of pedantic about it. I, for example, I don't want to go around saying little children are atheists. You hear some people say that. But really, we're talking about people who had a chance at least to consider the idea and have the concept and who then you know, don't have any belief in God and not prepared to, um, to have that belief. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask you this question because uh, it's very often that we hear, we hear religious people accusing atheists of this, so I'm not sure what you think about it, but do you think that there's necessarily a relationship between atheism and nihilism? Yeah, I'm never sure what nihilism really means, you know. You know there's an historical movement with that name, you know, sometimes a violent movement. Um, if they mean people who are just unrestrained in what they do, they have no inhibitions about their actions at all, uh, perhaps you know, philosophical well, not just philosophical egoists, but people who are something more than that. Yeah, they have, they have no. Because, because even an egoist, uh, in the strict sense, might, might gain pleasure from giving pleasure to others, right? <laughs> so maybe that person, that that egoist, might not fit the description. But if that's the sort of description they have in mind, there's no connection. I mean, there just is no connection. I don't know anybody who's really like that. Psychopaths maybe are like that, but. That's about having a certain kind of um, mentality, where, you know, whether we call it a um, you know, mental illness, Psycho psychopathy is another question, but it's a certain kind of mentality that's nothing to do with your beliefs about whether there are gods or not. Uh, so, so, so if that's the conception, well, I don't think there's any connection at all. Sometimes when people use that word, what they really mean is a certain... Yeah, meta ethical view, which yeah, you, I think you might want to get into. Yeah. And there it does get quite complex. But that, those sort of meta ethical views, while they may have a connection to atheism, yeah, they don't necessarily have connection to how people live, or, or at least they have very subtle connections. So I would not fear that. If you lose a belief in you know, the local god or the local gods, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that that means you're then going to turn into a psychopath and, and go around being you know, a nihilist or a nihilist, as some people seem to say. You, you, it's not going to have that effect. But there might be interesting meta-ethical questions that arise as to what's the basis of morality, what is morality, you know, is it what 
it's understood to be, and so on. Yeah, those are questions that arise in meta ethics, and they can be connected to issues, uh, yeah, to do with God, belief, and the religion. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will get into morality in a second, but uh, do you think that there necessarily needs to be a conflict between religion and science? Yeah, I don't say that there necessarily should be. Necessarily is a very strong word. Mm -hmm. But I do think that historically science is one of the things that has eroded religion in, you know, in Western societies. Mm -hmm. Because it provides explanations and it tends to undermine the need for religion. You know, to the extent that religion has provided explanations of all sorts of natural phenomena, all sorts of cultural phenomena, morality as we were saying, those have tended increasingly over the past, what, three or four hundred years, you might say especially since Darwin, but, but even before that. But, but those explanations from religion have tended to become less necessary. And, and as that happens, and, and in some cases, science even discovers you know, facts about the world that contradict traditional religious views. Right? Now, religion can often adapt. Religion is remarkably adaptable. But nonetheless, if you step back, if you look at these issues in a detached way, and you see religion having to adapt in the face of scientific progress, you might start to wonder, you know, was this religion you know, divinely founded in the first place? You know, why was it passed down in a way that had to adapt when it encountered science? So for those two reasons, at least, the fact that you know, science does discover facts about the universe, the world, even us as, you know, as a specific kind of animal, uh, that causes problems for religion as it forces religion to adapt, or, or at least it often forces religions to adapt. Um, but it also simply takes away some of the need for religion, or some of the intellectual need for religion. You know, we now have good ideas about why life takes the kind of diverse forms it does. We didn't have those before Darwin, but you know, now we have you know, very, very powerful explanations of that. We have very powerful explanations of a lot of ast you know, astronomical phenomena, all, all kinds of phenomena that once defeated our understanding. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean at all that a religious person can't be a scientist. No, I would not make that claim. No, I think that's too strong. I think as a religious person, you can say, look, I have these religious beliefs. Um, my religion has adapted, right? There, there are no direct conflicts uh, between my religion and science. That's a problem, I would say. But, but as the scientist, you might not say that is such a problem. That's an arguable point. Um, and what I'm here for is to conduct the observations, experiments, you know, testing hypotheses about the natural world. I, I think it's plain that, that that kind of practice as a scientist can go on and that there have been you know, many reputable scientists and still are who are, um, who are religious. Right? I, I think the way religion, among other, sorry, the way science, among other things, tends to undermine religion over time is more subtle than that. But nonetheless, you know, that they do have conflicting ways of reaching truth. Those ways often lead to different results. Uh, the scientific way often leads to very, you know, very powerful results you know, that may conflict with you know, what the religious way has said in the past. The religious way often seems just superfluous. Yeah, you know, those kinds of conflicts arise. Not necessarily, not in all cases, direct contradictions. But a, but a kind of conflict where you know, the two are, if not totally incompatible, certainly in a very strong tension with each other. Mm -hmm. but now, now they, again, that's not a very fashionable view. You, know, you see so many uh, books, articles, whatever, trying to reconcile science and religion. I think well, there are probably various political and other reasons for that, as well as sincere philosophical reasons. Uh, I concede some of the points that the conflict may not be as crude as it may sometimes have been portrayed in the past, but I think there is something that could be called a conflict or at least a tension that's there. Mm -hmm. 
What do you think about not science but scientism? Yeah, scientism, that's another one of those controversial words. And it's, a, it's not one of my words. You'll never hear me using that word. You'll hear me yeah. mentioning that word as if it's got you know, inverted commas around it. But, but you won't hear me accusing someone of scientism. I, I think it's a word we could really do without. It causes more confusion than it sheds light on anything. It's supposed to be something like, let's think, it's something like an idea that the only legitimate knowledge that we can find is obtained through science, right? Whatever science is, uh, uh, obtained through a scientific methodology. Now that immediately raises the question of what is science? You know, what is the scientific method? Is there a single scientific method? You know, what are scientific methodologies as opposed say to humanistic methodologies? And it gets very complicated. And in the end, I don't think that word sheds any light on any of the discussions. Often you'll hear the word used by theologians or you know, religious philosophers, and they want to use the word to condemn atheists, uh, philosophical atheists, or just other people who make strong claims about atheism. They want to condemn them if they don't accept what I would call spooky ways of knowing. Yeah, ways of knowing that are kind of mystical or supernatural, such as mystical experience itself, or revelation from God, or relying upon the words of a holy book, which is supposed to have been divinely inspired. Those sorts of you know, so-called ways of knowing, I think genuinely should be set aside, unlike humanistic ways of knowing, such as translating ancient inscriptions, right? You know, that's not especially scientific, at least not scientific in a narrow sense but it's a perfectly legitimate way of finding out about events that took place in the past, right? If somebody said that translating ancient inscriptions is a way of trying to work out what events happened in the past, because it's not scientific enough, and only sufficiently scientific uh, ways of knowing are legitimate, well, I suppose that person could be accused of scientism. But you don't really encounter those people. You know, I, I, I just don't think it's a useful word. I think to the extent that it is, to the extent that it's a word that could be applied to someone who is genuinely doing something wrong, something epistemically crazy, I don't think those people exist. They might exist on social media here and there. You, know, you might encounter some, someone who puts a very strange opinion in a debate on Twitter. But, 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 but serious people who write books, write articles and so on, they're not putting those kind of crazy views and trying to write them off as you know, embracing scientism. I think it's just a cheap shot at them. Mm -hmm. So for the rest of the interview, I would like to focus on issues regarding morality. Uh, yeah. You've written on the issue of moral authority. So what is moral authority? Well, I have this book, The Mystery of Moral Authority, as you know. And, and the point is, moral authority is mysterious. It, it, it seems that, you know, we go around in our day-to-day -day lives thinking that moral claims, whatever exactly we mean by moral claims, we have a sort of folk idea of what it means. We think that they're binding on us in some absolute way that cannot be escaped. And, and that transcends whatever our desires might be, transcend whatever social institutions we might have in place. But that's all quite hard to understand when you think about it. You know, what, what is this bindingness that, that morality, whatever that is again, you know, has, has over us? You know, when, when, when someone says, well, what you just did is morally wrong. Well, what does that really mean? It seems to mean that it's forbidden, but it seems to mean that it's forbidden not by a particular law or by the king, you know, someone who has political power, or by someone who has some other kind of local power. It's not forbidden by anyone in particular or by some social institution. It's just somehow forbidden in the nature of things. That, that, that's what it seems to me people are saying when they say, well, that's just wrong. Well, that, you know, that's, that's just 
not moral or it's immoral. They, they seem to have some concept like that in mind. Now, that claim, of course, is itself controversial within meta ethics. But my view is that that's what people seem to be saying. But that seems very mysterious. What is this forbiddenness in the nature of things? Well, if, if they are making some um, claim about forbiddenness in the nature of things, if that's what moral authority is, uh, you know, what Richard Joyce calls that you know, moral clout is the other expression that's sometimes used, but, but a kind of um, transcendent authority over us, a kind of, a kind of transcendent bindingness on how we are to act. That's, that's what I'm talking about in the mystery of moral authority. You know, we seem to believe in this, but it's very hard to nail down what it is beyond the kind of vague, you know, somewhat circular description that I've just given you. And it's very hard to see how it could exist. You know, I, I spend a lot of that book examining various ways that, well, maybe it could exist like this, or maybe it could exist, you know, in some other way. Maybe it's got something to do with God, as I raised earlier. But all of those explanations of it seem unsatisfactory, and I think we need to have a different sort of understanding of, of morality. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in the scientific world, or at least from a scientific point of view, there's any chance for morality to be objective? Well, I don't think it can be objective in the sense that I just described. But I, I don't think there's any chance that it can be yeah, objectively binding, to use that expression again, that it can have that, 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 that clout that we were just talking about. I don't see how science can, can give us that. I, certainly science can inform us of all sorts of things that can, you know, in principle, and to some extent in practice, science can inform us what actions we might take might you know, further happiness in the world or cause harm. Yeah, so science can give us all sorts of information that is relevant to how we should act, given that we might have goals of not causing people pain or, or not causing harm as defined in certain ways or, or goals of advancing welfare in certain senses. Science can certainly do that. But whether science can make um, morality binding on us in the way I've been discussing, well, no, I don't think it can. I don't think anything can. I don't, I don't really think the concept is, is um, coherent in the end, and perhaps that's why I'm floundering in, in defining the concept. But I do think it's a concept that people have, at least in a, a sort of vague way, even if they can't you know, give a coherent account of it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific position on meta-ethics? Well, yes. Well, partly my position on metaethics is what I've just been saying, that I think when you understand what morality claims of itself, that it cannot be all that it claims, or all that we tend, you know, in a commonsensical way to think it is. It can't be objective in the sense we've talked about. So, so I do take that position, which is a kind of sceptical position about morality. But I do have a more positive um, account, and it's... It's not an account that's terribly original to me. Other people have put similar accounts in the past. Now, Hobbes had a similar account. Hume, David Hume had a similar account. Um, J.L. Mackey, the uh, famous Australian moral philosopher, had a similar account. And that is that morality is a kind of social technology. You know, it's, a, it's a kind of social system whereby so societies can be coordinated, you know, coordination problems can be solved, uh, general ends that we might have of getting along together in the world, and perhaps with other societies as well, you know, those can be solved. We, we only want, I mean, you have to want to solve those problems before you can have a social morality or you know, a social institution that addresses them. But by and large, you know, human beings are social creatures and they're creatures that will often be you know, other human beings from other societies. These sorts of problems do arise. And by and large, you know, we do want to be able to get along in societies that are sustainable and can solve various problems. And so we need morality. You know, we, we need morality for those very widespread and widely accepted purposes. 
And so, you know, we have it as a kind of social technology. And in that sense, science can certainly help us, you know, can help us work out, well, what, what rules or what institutions and so on, you know, can help us solve those problems. Mm -hmm. Does moral scepticism fall under the rubric of moral anti-realism? Uh, it generally does, yes. Short answer to this. Uh, because moral realism, well, moral realism is a, a theory where morality uh, does say something that's objective and that, that's true in a in a traditionally understood way. The the various theories that are classified as anti-realism by most metaethicists will include relativist theories, right? Uh, subjectivist theories. Yeah, you know, skeptical theories. The sorts of theories that are considered realist theories would include, say, a theory that defines morality uh, in terms of some, oh, perhaps some naturalistic thing. So it might be said by a certain kind of moral realist that the good thing to do or the morally right thing to do just means you know, the thing that will maximise utility. Right, or you know, maximise happiness. That would be a moral relativist theory. You know, it's, it's defining morality that way. And there can be some, a fact. It might be a hard fact to discover, but, but there will be some fact as to what action in a particular situation you know, would have that effect. So that's one example of a moral realist theory. Another example would be a divine command theory. You know, the, the morally right thing to do is whatever God has commanded we do. Well, assuming God exists, there will be some fact of that matter. Again, it might be very hard to find out what it is. And other, you know, maybe it is just that somehow in the nature of things we're required to do certain actions and not do others. Well, again, that would be a moral realist theory. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question. And since earlier in our conversation, we talked about nihilism and the relationship between atheism and nihilism. Mm -hmm. What are your views on moral nihilism, and do you think that it can connect in any direct way to atheism? Well, if you think that morality comes from God, you're straight away going to think that someone who doesn't believe in God is not going to have a source of morality. Right? So from the, from the point of view of that person who has that theistic notion of morality they think once god goes you're left with no moral guidance at all so but, so that would be a connection if you accept that view which obviously i don't but but that would be a connection there, there, there is a theoretical connection there uh, and look a lot of people do take that view that morality comes from god that it comes from god's commands or perhaps it comes from the way god has set up the world um, you know, we have to act in a way that's harmonious with the world, the way God set it up. Some, some view like that. Uh, so, right, we take that view of what morality is, and we then, say, we then say God doesn't exist, and it follows that we've got rid of morality. Uh, on, on my account, of course, that's completely the wrong way of looking at it, because I think that morality is something that we need for the purposes of you know, social, social living social coordination and meeting other you know, widespread um, widespread aims we have, you know, such as the flourishing of our children. You know, we, we can name a whole lot of you know, very widely accepted aims that all human societies have, and we can investigate you know, what will actually conduce to achieving those aims. That's, that's my account of, of morality. Um, it does fall that I don't think morality is you know, binding on us in the way that the, um, you know, the theistic moralist might think it is. I think there are problems actually with that theory as well. But, but that's my account of morality. Just adjusting this headset here, which seems a bit possible. Bear with me for one second. Um, so that's the kind of connection that some people want to make. You get rid of God, you get rid of morality. I say, well, morality was never everything that it's commonly believed to be in the first place but it is something that we need and you know there are there are actions we can take of a rational kind 
to work out how to make it better from the point of view of our purposes. Mm -hmm. Very well. So, Dr. Blackford, I will be leaving some links to your work in the description box of the interview. Uh, thank you so much for your time and it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Okay, pleasure to talk to you, Ricardo. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassan, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punta, Radana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.